What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Um, before I introduce today's guest, I'm really excited about this conversation. You know, Jonathan, I always like to tell people what other episodes would be cool to check out. And, you know, I will give you a formal introduction, Jonathan Jacobs of nativesgroup.com, but really he helps um, you know, executives, you know, especially executives who write books, get their books out there to everyone and anyone and handles a lot, all the back end marketing. And, and so I was thinking, who, what authors that I've had on that would be fun to listen to uh, from a podcast? I had Bob Berg. He's written a bunch of books. I've had Cameron Harold. He's written a, a number of books. Um, Jay Samet, uh, Gary Ridge from WD40 talks about, he started off in WD40 as like a low level position and worked his way up to CEO, uh, Perry Marshall, 80, 20 sales and marketing. And there's many more. So check out inspiredinsider.com. Um, and before we get to this, this episode is brought to you by rise 25 and at rise 25, we help businesses. I like to say, Jonathan, give to and connect to their dream 100 relationships and partnerships by helping you run your podcast. Uh, basically we are an easy button for a business to launch and run your podcast. And in my opinion, I was saying this, Jonathan, before is self-serving. I think every business should have a podcast period, just like we all have websites. We should have a podcast. And the reason is, you know, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at a way to give to my best relationships. And I can do that by profiling the people I love and admire on my podcast and introducing them to my audience and other people. And so if you've thought about doing it, Go to rise25.com, learn more. We have a bunch of videos and everything like that. And you can email us anytime on the contact page. So check that out. Today's guest, very excited. Jonathan Jacobs is a founding partner of Digital Natives Group. And they've been a digital marketing agency he established in 2011. So he's been doing this a long time. He's built a seven-figure social media practice from the ground up. He's helped launch social media platforms for global sports brands, projects for Fortune 500 companies, and nearly... Well, 100 book launches, many of them bestsellers, and the team at Digital Natives have worked with many authors to build their brands and online presences, collaborating to build that community. Because when you build that community, Jonathan, you'll, you'll speak more to this, you can call upon them to take action, whether it's yeah. read a book cool. or get a course or you know, just subscribe to the, the newsletter. And they've had clients like the NFL, Dr. David Perlmutter, and many more. So Jonathan, thanks for joining me. Thank you. It's great to be here today. I'm excited to have this conversation. I'm excited for all of you who are going to be listening. Uh, thanks for giving us your time. You know, I think um, you're going to walk us through some of the stuff that you've helped people get to, like, I don't know what we say, quote unquote, bestseller status and really mm -hmm. launch. Yeah, emphasis and also, on the quotes. Yeah, on bestseller it, it, status and, nowadays. and um, advice, even as an experienced agency owner. But I wanted to mm -hmm. start with, you know, since you've worked with so many authors, CEOs, what are some of your favorite nonfiction books that you like? Yeah, well, I'm going to, you know, we do a ton of work in nonfiction, as you pointed out. Within that, we do a lot of work in health and wellness and also working with business executives and CEOs. Um, I wanted to talk specifically to, to business books, so I think your audience would be interested in that. I've got a few here. The first one I always have to plug that I, I don't have with me because I loaned it out it is Good to Great by Jim Collins. I think that's just one of the greatest business books of, of all time. I use that, the advice and the guidance shared in that as I think about how we drive our agency day to day. Um, so I always recommend that if you haven't checked it out yet. The next book I would recommend is Thanks for the Feedback uh, hmm. by Doug Stone and Sheila Heen. Um, they have two books on the subject. Uh, this is the follow-up to Difficult Conversations. Um, the subtitle here is The Science and Art of Receiving Feedback Well even when it's off base, unfair, poorly delivered, and frankly, hmm. you're not in the mood. This was a I really love that. powerful, it was a really powerful book. I mean, this is actually my second copy of it because again, I gave away the other one, but my first one is, is marked up like crazy. I mean, you, you know, and here even, I still have underlines. Um, I took a ton of notes on this book. It was really powerful to think about how do I have difficult conversations with my business partner? And it was valuable for me to take it. I preferred approaching it from the feedback side first. 
because I want to think about how am I going to process this and then also put myself myself in the shoes of the recipient to think about receiving that. And I actually, because of that, found this book more useful than I did difficult conversations, though I highly recommend that as well. Uh, the next book I would suggest if you are obviously in, in the marketing world, uh, ideally, if you're listening to this, is this uh, called The Copy Book. It is an anthology of advice and guidance from some of the greatest copywriters and, and ad execs in the, the history of this business and industry. It's a beautifully done book. It's like a miniature coffee table book. Maybe we'll call it a nightstand book. Um, I basically, you know, every day I'll pick, I'm in the process of reading it now, I'll pick one uh, mini chapter, which is a set of advice and examples from one different copywriter and go through and read it. Uh, you know, I think storytelling is the basis and the most powerful element of our industry. So to me, continuing to figure out how I tell story, stories and the words we can use is really important. Will you um, stick on that one for a second, Jonathan? Yeah, who, are, yeah. who are some of the copywriters mentioned in there? If you, so, yeah. Yeah. So these are going to be people from, I think this, this book goes back at least like 50, 60 to 70 years of copy history in here. So yeah. I'm just going to shout out some of the names. Yeah. Um, you may or may not recognize them. David Abbott, Ed McCabe, John Salmon, Steve Simpson, uh, mm. Mary Weir, Eric Coleman, Steve Hayden, mm. uh, Neil French, Richard Foster, a uh, really, really powerful list here of okay. folks who've, you know, kind of shaped this industry and yeah. great stories. I mean, folks who worked on things like the famous VW campaign in the sixties, like really, really great stuff. Ah, that's timeless stuff. And I ask, cause I and went really, on this, I totally agree with you. I think the foundation for everything is storytelling and copywriting, whether it's an email, whether we're talking, and I went on the stint of interviewing over a hundred of the top direct response marketer copywriters on the planet. And so mm. I was curious and I, no one has mentioned that book and I'm like, I oh, need to great, check out this book. book. So, yeah, it's a great little, like if, when I, you know, if you're doing like a, what is it? The Pomodoro method. This is a great way to spend those few minutes in between tasks to just like give yourself some creative energy. Yeah. Um, the last book I will give you, and I, I don't think people would traditionally consider this a business book. I think people probably think of it as a memoir but it's who is Michael Ovitz and it's Michael Ovitz's memoir. So uh, if you're not familiar with Michael Ovitz, he is the guy who founded CAA, one of the big, was the big three agencies in the, in the uh, creative arts industry. What I love about this, but a, I'm a pop culture and film junkie. So for me, this book has a ton of value within it and, and the stories I absolutely love. The photos are great. Um, but I love it because it is not written like a traditional business book. Um, he doesn't try to give you a lesson at the end of every chapter. He doesn't tell you, hey, here's what I'm, I'm going to kind of set out and say from the beginning. And, and here's what you should take away from it and exactly what you should do. It's really told as um, it's really just told as a story. And then it's kind of on you to figure out, all right, what speaks to me as a lesson within this book? And I'm trying to see if I can find a good example of a note uh, from here yeah. that I took on. Yeah. As you do um, that, I'll just yeah. say that's a hilarious title because when you say Michael, or it's, I'm like, well, who, it makes me like, well, who's Michael? Well, that's the, that's the title of the book. So you got to kind of read it. To, yeah. <laughs> to know, yeah, to exactly. Know it like, well, here, I'll give you two snippets. You know, one is yeah. this section. He goes, you have to risk alien. You now, again, he's talking about as an agent, but I, again, it can have applications well outside of that. You have to risk alienating your client. When you tell someone the truth, all they can do is get upset. They can't call you an idiot. Uh, and again, I think that's a really powerful reminder. Live your truth. You have an experience, you have an opinion, you may have fact. You can't control how people respond. You can only control your honesty to your own story. And, and another one I'll give you, you know, this section a little bit more traditional. He lists, lists the four commandments that CAA has. So it's something he said at the bottom that I thought really valuable. If you were confident about your own work, why snipe at someone else? you know what? I don't have to spend time complaining about the work my competition does. If someone wants to bring me in and say, you know, how could we improve what we're doing? That's one thing, but I'm not here to critique the agency that's doing it because yeah. they're doing it un under what is their truth for what this needs to be to succeed. And I may not agree with that, but I'm not here to be petty over that story. That doesn't help me get ahead. That doesn't lift the industry up. That doesn't lift people up. Um, and I thought that was valuable. Now, granted, yeah. that coming from a Hollywood agent may seem a little bit hollow to people. <laughs> um, but the book, I mean, I, I, we, I read this on vacation. I devoured it. And, and I do highly uh -huh. recommend it because it's, it's a fun thing to read. And you happen to learn some interesting lessons along the way. Yeah. You, I mean, you're saying just let your work speak for itself, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Let's talk about, I'm curious. So I want to talk about uh, Dr. David Perlmutter and kind of the things you did with him. 
did you change anything from your daily habits with working with him? Because obviously, if you don't know his his work, I love his work. I mean, he has, uh, I think, The Grain Brain. He's got a, a number of books, The Brain Maker. Yeah. Um, and it's really, he's got some just amazing research and you know life's work around making people healthier and helping them be healthier. So yeah. I'm wondering if you changed anything. Yeah. So it's funny you say that. I always used to tell people, if you could tell, if you could take me back 15 years when I was starting college and tell me I'd come out of the startup marketing agency and I would launch the book that is like the foundation of the gluten-free movement, I would have thrown a glass of water in your face because I used to be 265 pounds, really? eating whatever I wanted. Um, this was not an area that I cared about at all. Flash forward, you know, here we are and I've launched my team and I have launched not just Grain Brain, but, you know, dozens of other bestsellers in the health and wellness space. So uh, but I will say, we when we did Grain Brain, I did the Grain Brain diet for about six weeks. I lost, I think, 22 pounds. Wow. Um, and then I did go through a cycle for a little while where every diet book we did, I would or uh, lifestyle book we did, I would try the suggested practices within reason. I mean, I didn't, I don't have a gluten sensitivity. So for me, I wasn't looking to get rid of Heinz ketchup. I'm sorry, it's the best ketchup. I'm not interested in, in other options. Like I will, I will take the gluten and sugar. It's fine with me. Uh, but I would try within reason. And I occasionally did do them. But I, you know, what I always say is, um, what that book taught me is that as a Jew from New York, I do not need to eat pizzas and bagels every day of the week. I think it changed it changed my relationship with carbs in a way where I can have this if I want to, not it's breakfast, let me have a bagel. Like a bagel is the thing. I, I always say like I probably went from being someone who had pizzas or a bagel at least once a week to being someone who has that maybe once a month. And that's a huge, that's like a huge behavior change. Um I would say I probably have more bread or carbs now because if you have a partner who does not follow that lifestyle that you're living with, it can be very hard. It's just it's around hard. and totally. Yeah. Like I, I've always said, I mean, I lost a lot of weight because I don't have willpower when it's in the house, but I have the willpower to not buy it. But once it's here, all bets are off. I, uh, but yeah, I'm, so I did, I'm with you on that. Yeah. I did change my habits when I read the book and it, it did stick. Um, I also quit diet soda at that point. That has been my pandemic vice, though. It has come back into my routine during all this. Um, although I don't think that's the worst vice I could have chosen. I'm sure it'll work its way out with them in the world more. Uh, but yeah, no, I definitely definitely took some of those uh, uh, tips and, and guidance that he gave to heart. So what is he, he's basically saying cut out things with gluten in or? Yeah. So I mean, granted, this book was 2013. The, the message at that point was low car, a low carb diet, a gluten free diet, a grain minimal diet. Yeah. Um, his work has, as science has evolved, his work has evolved over the past almost decade. Um, we've got, you know, now it's focused on a, uh, a, a, a probiotic rich diet. Uh, so things like fermented foods, kimchi, kombucha, yeah. tempeh. Yeah. Um, so that's now a huge emphasis of what he does. He's a little bit more, uh, you know, keto Mediterranean or some of the words that are thrown around in reference to him. He, he focuses a little bit more on plants now. Yeah. Um, and we we just announced we're working on his next book. It's called uh, Love, which is the low it's a low uric acid diet, so minimizing mm. the amount of fructose that you consume. Yeah. So you know, when I think of him, I changing. think of the the, the gut the gut health, health yeah. and yeah. the probiotics and the fermented foods. That's what I think of. But I know, yeah, and you that's know, really where we've been for the past six yeah. years. So that makes sense. Yeah, but I mean that that work done years ago. I mean, what which was now it's I don't know it, it's a popular view with the paleo and all these other mm -hmm. things, but, but his grain brain really was, was one of the works that yeah. was out there that most people weren't talking about this stuff. Yeah. And the New York times, and this is probably a good segue to talk about the project a little bit. The New York times referred to it as one of the foundational texts of the gluten-free movement. And that's because that first book, which came out in 2013, grain brain was on the bestseller list for 47 weeks, mm. um, which is, uh, as we can assume a very long time. Um, it takes a lot for a book to to make the list for that long. Um, you know, you have to be an Obama or you're you're on that book educated. Like that, that's how you get on the list for that long. But what I think made that book so successful when it came out is 2013 was a very different marketing landscape than we are in right now. Forget about like tick, the fact that I'm not even talking about the fact that TikTok and Clubhouse didn't exist. We didn't have live video functions. Organic reach was still possible. You know, we, we would regularly post content that would hit 50 to 500 percent of his audience on Facebook because we had a strong content strategy. So when we launched that book, 
we really just relied on human psychology and we said, okay, what do these people need to help share and navigate for our message? What they're looking for is gluten-free was still not in the mainstream at that point. Low carb was not in the mainstream at that point. So we said, let's give these people the science and the facts that they need to endorse their lifestyle choice. And they're going to want to share that A, to tell everyone else and B, to tell the people who disagree with them, hey, see, I was right. That's just human nature, right? When, no matter what, when you get evidence that supports your lifestyle choice and someone told you it's wrong, you want to- And, and luckily them. it's actually yeah. factual evidence because people use fake evidence all the time. Yeah. So it's and better we had than the it. science. Yeah, right. we didn't have just, we had anecdote and we had science behind it. Um, so putting that out there, like I said, we, were, we could regularly hit a huge portion of the audience. We really, you know, we rocket shipped, rocket shipped to social before the launch because of that. And that's what to me really made that book a success is that we got to those people in a way where we were able to become the foundation for their scientific understanding of this lifestyle. Um, and that's what made Grain Brain such a success. And that, but then of course, we've worked on him with, I think four, four or five books since then, each one has come at a different time in the social media landscape. So you know, even just jump forward to his next book, and now I'm forgetting if it was 14 or 15, but it was his cookbook. I think it was 14. His cookbook comes out, now video is coming out as a key component of these platforms. So now we're, and but fortunately we're working with food. Uh, so we were saying, all right, we got to produce some high quality recipe videos. Like people are going to want to see how to make these, these things. We want to better connect them with you face-to-face -face and visually. Um, so we, we spent a lot of time going into what seems crazy given the landscape of video now, but high quality video production, informative content around that. And that helped make that book a bestseller. And, and cookbooks, if anyone's familiar with, it's hard to make those a bestseller. The, the ones that really are come from established brands to begin with. So uh, that made that a real success. We go- Stick on that and, for one second yeah, until yeah. we go to the next one, Jonathan. So yeah. talk about, you know, the organic versus paid and some of the stuff that you're doing for them, you know, because the first one, like you were saying, the grain brain, there was a lot of organic reach. Mm -hmm. um, what were some of the things you were doing now with the cookbook? Was it the same kind of ratio of organic or paid? Yeah. Or maybe maybe get a little granular so people can understand kind of what what are the stuff you're you're doing with them? Yeah, you know, it's it's funny you say that. I forget if it was, but I think it was the cookbook. I think it was the cookbook and I'm going to tell this story because it was the cookbook or the next book. It kind of doesn't matter, but it's worth telling the story now because we're talking about paid. We had an $800 budget for paid ads in a given month. And at this particular point in time, his publisher was kind of going to the mat uh, with uh, Amazon because they were having an argument. It was so his publisher to shut them in one other house. There was an argument that basically about the royalties and the cost per sale being paid from Amazon to publishers. So people could not pre-order his book on Amazon. Yes. Can we go order from Barnes and Noble? Can we go call up the store and order it? Sure. Do people go and do that when Amazon is the best option, the easiest option? No. Um, so we had a real challenge of how do we get people to pre-order this book? And if you're familiar with book publishing, creators are incredibly important if you're trying to list. And also, if you want to send indicators to retail that this book is going to be big, we had a real challenge there. How do we drive people to Barnes & Noble and make them want to do it? So that was kind of the focus of our paid ads component. So I, I set our $800 budget for a couple ad sets for the month. And I walk away from my computer. I come back the next day. The book is number two on Barnes & Noble. And we were like, what the heck happened? So I go in, I, we start trying to figure it out. Nothing had changed. We didn't send an email. There were no interviews. There was no new blog post that went up. Like social hadn't even been, social content had not been posted in that time frame. The only thing that happened was I started these ads. So I said, let me see what was effective. Well, it turns out I had set it to spend $800 in a day. So we spent all of the budget for the month in 24 hours. I never sounds like only, it was worth it though. Yeah. I only told the story about two years ago. Cause I was like, uh, I don't want people to know I made that mistake, but I want them to know why it came of it. But um, really just kind of proof in a very short time frame, we made something super powerful happen with $800 in budget. Um, and it shouldn't have been that easy because we became the number two book on all of Barnes and Noble with a cookbook when it's already hard to make sales happen on Barnes and Noble. So I, I would also argue, Again, a different time in terms of how competitive Facebook ads were at that point. At that point, um, but paid to all all of this way of thing, paid became incredibly important the more we went forward because even that year later, organic reach was beginning its its very steep decline uh, to where we are today in this you know 
five percent, one percent fraction of a percent range. Um, you know, now when we do book launches, I think we traditionally have always had like a three to five k budget for these things, but we're 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 telling people to prepare to invest more. Um, and the way that we always say, the way to think about it is, you know, it is a faucet, and we're going to open it up and close it based on when we have things that are performing. But you've got to be ready to spin that thing until it comes loose. If we've got something that really works, because if we can build that positive ROI funnel, we got to keep this thing going. Yeah. I love that. So I interrupted you. So the next after mm -hmm. the cookbook, what was, what was the yeah, next? So the cookbook uh, brings us to 2015. His next book, uh, that would be Brain Maker um, then that we worked on. Uh, and, and that starts to bring us more towards uh, kind of, I would say Brain Maker and his book in 2016, The Green Brain Whole Life Plan, came at a very similar time. They came out within a year of each other. And anecdotally, the book Grain Brain was supposed to come out the last week of October 2016. And we, we threw a fit about it because if you knew any, the media landscape ahead of the election, you, you couldn't get any air, any air time. There was nowhere to go. There's nowhere to go on social media. So we pushed it to the week after the book came out. And I'll never forget. Uh, he says, you know, no matter what happens, it's going to be the first post-apocalyptic bestseller. <laughs> <laughs> According to at least 50% of the world, it's going to be a post by Louis Bestel, uh, which is very funny. And lo and behold, it was. We were a bestseller with that book, again, with Frame Maker. But those two books kind of are joint because they came out of the time when we were starting to realize social media is not going to be the answer. Social media is going to be a part of the answer, but we've got to figure out the rest of the strategy. So there was kind of a two pronged approach. And that was to say, A, how do we get introductions to the audiences of Dr. Perlmutter's audience? Because his people are always going to buy the book at a certain rate. But we don't want to limit ourselves to figuring out how do we get these half a million, how do we keep squeezing these half a million people? How do we keep squeezing this sponge to get all the money out of them? At a certain point, they might not do it. We need to keep growing that pie. Um, so what we focused on was saying, how can we use our promoters network to get introductions to large pots of people that we could pick from? So for us, it was figuring out how do we capitalize? We didn't really build a traditional affiliate model, which I'm sure some of your listeners are familiar with in terms of like a pay to play scheme or, or giving kickbacks for, for link traffic. We just said, let's do live interviews. Let's provide content. Let's provide blog sharing back and forth. Let's, let's give information. Like, like a collaboration. Exactly. We did everything we could to establish collaborative partnerships because we wanted that trusted introduction to that person's 50,000 person Facebook page, that person's 10,000 person email list, because that is more, a much more qualified action than someone seeing the book on the stand at Barnes and Noble or seeing our paid ad on Facebook. So that was kind of part one. And then part two was that's when everything started to come back to email more in the mainstream. So we were saying, all right, we've got this big audience. How do we convert them to his email list? And then how do we funnel that email list to turn them into book buyers? So that was really a key part um, when all of that came out. And I think everything we started doing then really peaked with what we did for the book that came out last year, Brainwash, in January of 2020, when Organic Reach, again, now basically gone, that book was a bestseller because of what we did to build and enrich on those personal relationships a really strong Instagram live strategy in terms of generating as much, like we, we view Instagram live as the new TV. How many channels can we be on at once? Um, and then uh, again, the, uh, the email component of that as well. So like that collection of email, pay, you know, uh, qualified introductions and, and IG lives, I think are really what help to take, make a book take off right now. Yeah. And it benefits the other party as well in that collaboration, because now mm -hmm you know, you have a huge, I mean, Dr. Perlman has a huge audience. And so they're going to want to help because he'll, he'll probably, great, I'm going to push this out to my audience. They're going to find out about what you're, you're working on also. And, you know, if anyone, you know, ch you checks out the brain maker is just a big head of broccoli. And um, you've probably seen I've it out there. The cover art. Yeah, yeah cover it's art great. Right. And it's the power of the gut microbes to heal. And that's, that's kind of mm -hmm. how I think about them. And you know, like my um, solution for you, Jonathan, is replacing diet soda is like, I, I am addicted to yeah. kombucha. Um, I always Love, have it yeah. within arm's reach. I had the the founder of Wild Tonic on who I love oh, their kombucha yeah. and it's made from honey. And I, I remember I was walking out of the this specialty grocery store. I got the wild tonic blueberry basil, which is one of my favorites. And I snapped a picture. I emailed well, them. I haven't tried that. I'll have to look in. Look you have to. It's, yeah. I emailed them. I'm like, I'd love to have you on. I'm a huge fan and was able to kind of talk about how she created this. But um, so back to, you know, the, the collaborative partnerships for a second. I was just trying to get you healthier with the off the diet soda to the, <laughs> the kombucha. No, it's good. But, 
<laughs> that, that's my attempt. Um, but the collaborative partnerships, who were good, like-minded health individuals out there that were mm. um, good collaborations with Dr. Perlmutter? Yeah, I mean, you know, Dr. Perlmutter, we, he's been in the space for a while and we've helped establish him. So, I mean, he, he we get to play at a very top top of the flight class there. And, you know, we get to work with the Dr. Mark Hyman, Dr. Daniel Amen, uh, Dr. Will Bolsawix, um, Dr. Terry Walls, uh, Dr. Jeff Bland. I mean, these are some of the leading names and folks in kind of functional medicine, plant-based medicine, the keto, keto diet and lifestyle, uh, Dr. Will Cole, a lot of really great and, and powerful folks yeah. um, who, who not only have influence, but who, who change lives. The work yeah, that do. no, I love that. And, and, and mo- not everyone knows my background is actually in biochemistry and as a chiropractor. So I was reading mm-hmm. um, Jeff Bland's books, like, I don't know, whenever they first came out, this functional medicine books. I mean, he's been around forever. Um, yeah. I'm even thinking in the, in 2000 ish, I think his book was, but um, so Let's talk. I want to switch gears. Anything else on the uh, Dr. Perlmutter that would be interesting to to talk about? Because I want to move on to the NFL for a second. But anything else interesting with the launches and releases and selling more books? You know, I think with um, Dr. Perlmutter, I think that's really that that story really captures kind of what makes it happen really well. And I think, you know, for your, for people who are going to listen to this now, what I would say is really start to think about uh, potential value of Clubhouse. You know, we have seen a few folks on there, not clients of ours, but anecdotally, when I go on and watch, Adam Grant had done one. Um, his book, suddenly, I, it wasn't in the top 10 on Amazon before his Clubhouse. It was obviously doing very well, but suddenly it jumped into the top, um, I think, three during his Clubhouse because he had like 2,000 people in there. He had the really influential people in the space, you know, Jen Rubio, um, I think um, Sofia Amorosa, like other, you know, CEOs, founders, startup execs uh, coming in. And then there was someone else who had a book and I'm blanking on her name come out about a week or two ago. And she also shot to the top three on Amazon. Uh, while she was doing a really powerful clubhouse. And that obviously was not the only component of it, but if you can get that many tastemakers in a room Mm. and a few, you know, people are going to get pinged that they're in that room on clubhouse. And then also it continues the conversation afterwards. So I think we're looking at how do we evaluate that now for clients. And I think in the COVID era for people think about, again, think about Instagram live as, as the new PR platform, you know, our goal with our clients is, Let's get as many interviews as we can during launch week on Instagram. We want to be on all the channels. Whenever somebody opens up that app, they should see you doing an interview with someone on there. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, yeah. That, that's, that's, uh, I love hearing those little tips too, because people are probably neglecting some of those channels or they don't know enough about it. So they're just going to not use it. Right. Um, so what the NFL, what kind of things did you do with the NFL? Yeah, that was a really fun one. And, it, you know, I always think about it. People always ask must have been so exciting and cool. And it definitely was, but it's also a little bit like working in the ice cream parlor. You don't want to have ice cream anymore when you're done. Uh, so it definitely changed my fandom for a little while, but we had a really fun charge. You know, we got to work with them. It started our relationship with, I think it was Super Bowl 47 that was in New York City. So that's when we started working with them because they needed a local agency to do some activation. Um, we specifically worked with their consumer products division. Um, and within that, there's kind of two pieces. There's mer- there's actual merch and like sales. And we didn't really do that. That's NFL shops. That's a, a, a NFL shop that's run by, um, I'm blanking on the name of the company right now, Fan. Uh, you, you all know the name and you will recognize it. And someone listening will remember, but I'm, I'm currently blanking on it. I don't know the, the name seat. either. So um, yeah. it'll come to me as soon as we finish. Um, but they're a very famous company that does most of the merch, most of the handling of like sales and, and end of end of purchase uh, with the sports leagues. But then there's consumer products, which is where we were, which is kind of like the licensing department. And then also working on the idea of purchase. So the way I always said it is while everybody else owns, you know, Sunday and Monday nights, we are here to own Tuesday through Saturday. How do you be a fan outside of the game, outside of the stadium? Um, so how do you work it into your everyday life? What what does a fan eat? What does a fan sleep in? What does a fan drink? What does a fan bring to their wedding? What's at your desk? 
Um, so it was all these really fun ideas of just how do we build the culture of fandom? Like what traditions do we tap into? What, 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 what do we create around that? So we got to do some really fun stuff while we worked with them. Um, you know, it's hard to pick a favorite, but one of the things I enjoyed the most was we did a lot of influencer marketing. And what we did for two years on a shoestring budget was build an influencer network of about eight to 10 influencers. And we basically ran them as a fantasy football league. But then through that, we're able to generate all this content with them all season long. Um, so we got to build some really fun partnerships. And, you know, I think an, an endorsement and a data point behind something I'm sure some of your listeners who have worked with uh, influencers before know, we worked with influencers who had 9,000 uh, uh, Instagram followers, and that was primarily where they were all based. And we worked with Instagram influencers who had 900,000 followers, who drove the most sales and traffic, the, the influencers with, you know, 15,000 and fewer followers which was, we all knew that that would probably be the case. We knew we'd get more impressions up here, but we knew we'd actually make the dollars and cents down here. It was just amazing to actually see the numbers behind it and the degree of difference. It was really, really wow. incredible. Um, and it's also just funny because when you bring the case to the public or to an award submission, the impressions is the impressive number that everybody wants to see. Those dollars are, are less impressive because they're perhaps they're not as significant a number. You, you never generate as many dollars as you do impressions out of something, or depending on the price point of what you're selling, because we have so many different things we never would. But that to me was the number that was most powerful because it was driven by such a smaller component of what we did. Like, yes, the, the story was helped to be sold by the impressions, and hopefully that leads to more dollars in the future. But the short-term revenue growth yeah. came from the smaller group who could really form a bond and a connection uh, with, their, with their audience. That is interesting. I would love to hear, how do you choose an influencer? So uh, first of all, of course, there are constraints, right? There's constraints of budget and, and content. So things like that, I think, are, are kind of the obvious ones. Like we're doing the NF NFL, when we're going to be talking about fashion and food and the sport, uh, going to someone who's a book influencer doesn't really make sense. Um, so, and then also someone who might be too much money. So there are some obvious constraints there. It's also getting harder the way that some of these platforms are changing. So there was a hubbub this week about Instagram properly rolling out the hiding of likes um, platform wide. That would make our job a lot harder. Now, there are a lot of great tools for, for finding influencers. Sometimes we use them, sometimes we don't. I mean, at this point, we've built up our own internal database of who we like to work with um, and who's valuable for our audience. Sometimes we'll use a third-party tool if we feel like it's valuable. So there are those that you can go to. And I'm, I'm blanking on the names. I can send you some links to some after if you want to put it in the post around them. Um, but I think for us, we look at, we, we really want to make sure if we're building a, a group or we're going to work with a few, a diversity of audience size, a diversity of approaches to the topic, a diversity of creator. Are we representing who our consumer actually is? Uh, and, and then I think we're looking at, you know, will they actually tell the story we want them to tell about this? Not to say we need to have control of the content, but if the story, you know, if we want them to talk about football in a certain way, are they going to be too focused on the on-field product and not as much on their enjoyment of the on-field product? So it was kind of looking at what's their approach to storytelling and will it help or Will it help us uh, move towards the goal that we've set for the project? Does it help you to be like we are you you'll be working to represent the NFL for people who maybe charge more or you know maybe wouldn't do a project or do you find that factors in at all? It did. Yeah. The first year we did it, people just wanted to work with us. But then as people got larger, they didn't want it. So it helps us with that, like, let's say, 100,000 and below group. Who are on the way up and now they can they can take hey i worked with the nfl and convert that into another brand um once you get a little bit larger it's a little tougher um sometimes they're willing to sometimes they're not and it, i mean listen i also don't love it either we did it on no budget because they wanted proof of concept before we could really throw money behind it and you know i i struggle a lot with that because i don't you know this is I, and i think it's also common in our industry and something that a lot of people who are better than me are currently working to solve and advocate for is I think we are we chronically underpay and we chronically undervalue. Uh, you know, something like think about there are common stories of of course internships are case in point number one. We've only ever done paid internships at natives, but in this industry, unpaid internships and minimally paid internships are one of our most terrible acts of negligence, in my opinion. Um, but beyond that, uh, you know, we we have a history of not valuing the work that the people at the lowest point in the food chain do. You know, we see these job postings going around of like social media manager, thirty-five thousand dollars. Who can live in New York City on thirty-five thousand dollars? I don't mean 
to sound overly privileged uh, in terms of that, that I wouldn't appreciate having that amount of money, but the quality of work that these people are going to do in the place they're choosing to live, that is not a realistic salary um, to be paying someone. And it's because in my opinion, that, that work is undervalued. Um, but, you know, it even goes deeper than that into the hiring process and people talk about, um, I'm going on a tangent now, but this is one of my hills. So I'd like to die on it if that's okay. Keep with going, me. keep going. <laughs> um, you know, you do, you ask for work samples. Uh, for specific prompts or for spe specific challenges during the interview process, and people don't pay for that work. You're asking someone to do work. Sometimes it might even be for actual clients you have. You know, for us it is because we really want to see can they integrate into what we do. But we always pay for that work, and we also don't make it cumbersome. If we're if, if we're going to do a fake client, we will get a little bit grander with what we do because we don't want them to feel like we're just asking them to do the work and as a contractor. But we're going to ask them to do something for an actual client of ours. You know, we may not say, hey, write a white paper, but we'll say, hey, write a blog post or write five social media totally. posts just so we can see how you grasp the material. And again, and of course, we'll always pay for that particular thing. Um, so I think it's, you know, your question was about um, sort of being able to, uh, how do we, is the, does the brand have value with influencers? It absolutely does. But I think as a whole, I wish it was not that way in our space. And we were thinking more about how can we make sure we are paying people for the true value of what they create. Yeah. That takes me, you know, John, the next thing I want to talk about, which is your advice for agency owners, right? And mm -hmm. so, you know, we talked a little before we hit record about pricing, negotiating, explaining the value of what you do and, and um, just keep going on that topic of explaining the value, right? So yeah, demonstrating the value to a brand who, you know, they want to spend the least amount of money and get the most amount of value as in yeah. a lot of people do. So but, start there. You know, I think we work with, um, and I think a lot of agencies who might be listening to this can write with is you work across a diversity of individuals. There's a key difference to me with a good client versus a bad client. It's not about the size of their budget. It is not about the size of the company. It's do they view marketing as an expense or as an investment? I will take investment to people no matter the size. Please don't send me expenses because expenses, the example I, I always give is I could run $500. I could run $150 on a Facebook ad that doesn't perform for a, a client who is an expense client. And that could terminate the relationship because that money didn't lead to anything. I could spend $1,000 on, on a Facebook ad investment that doesn't work for a investment client. And they will give me a slap on the wrist and say, what did you learn? Let's make it better next time. There's a huge difference there. I, I should never feel like I have to constantly be looking over my shoulder before I do something to determine if it's gonna work or not. Because um, Jay Powell, who is a, a social media marketer and a marketer in general that I really look up to on Twitter, uh, she does a great job. Uh, she, was, um, she tweeted something the other day, you know, I, I'm gonna butcher it. But it was basically the idea of like, what we do in marketing sometimes is our best guess. And then we're going we're gonna to keep working away at that as we figure out what works and what doesn't. And then in six months, it might not work anymore. I might have to change it again. And like, I think we, we, we forget that there really aren't truisms in this work. Every brand is going to be successful for a different reason. Every thought leader is going to lead based on something different. You know? And so to that, I say, I always tell agency owners, and we tell this to our clients, they will come to us, especially our authors, and say, we want, we want to go there. I want you to do for me what you did for David Perlmutter. And they say, take me to that spot on the mountain. But there, what they need- Take me to the promised land, John. Exactly. But what they want is walk the same path and take no risk. I can't, we can't do that because eventually if you walk that path enough times, the earth gives out underneath you and you have a landslide and you fall back at the beginning. What we need is someone who can say that and then hear me say back to them, I'm your, I'm your trekker. I'm going to take you on a journey to the top of the mountain, but you need to have faith that we as individuals and we as a team know the best route to get you there. And we may sometimes make a mistake, but we'll backtrack and then we'll find the way to the top from there. It's just like navigating a maze. There, there is a route to get to the top, but we're going to have to work to figure it out. And you need to trust us to get you there safely. Yeah. If you're constantly pulling me back and saying, well, this isn't working. Where are we going? Where are we going? It's like having the kid in the car. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? It becomes the, it's an awful experience for everyone and you just want to pull over and go home. So, you know, I, I, if I can offer any advice to agency owners, always think about, do you have someone who's going to hold your pack back or someone who's going to follow you wherever you're trying to lead? And, and I, I say this explicitly to clients, it's like, no, you are joining us on the journey of discovery. We're going to work together on this. We will be transparent about this. We will admit our failures on this. We'll, we'll talk about when we're going back. 
but we cannot promise you the same journey as someone else who did this. Uh, because it, it, to the point of David Perlmutter, it doesn't work anymore. Organic reach doesn't exist like it did seven years ago when we made Grain Grain the best seller. So, you know, Landscapes change, platforms exactly. change, uh, uh, you know, there could be an event in the world that changes, you know, like pandemics or elections or whatever, stuff changes. So you always have to, move. And, and to your point, yeah. like best guess, you know, what, what makes, what I think about Jonathan is you go to the doctor, you have a migraine. They could give you a pill. It's like, I think this will work. You know, let's try it out for a few weeks. And then you can go back and be like, no, yeah. still have the migraines. Well, let's try this. So in, in all these practices, it's a best guess. There is yeah. no, nothing, the same thing doesn't work for everyone. You wouldn't go back to your doctor and be like, you're fired. That pill you gave me didn't do, didn't do the migraines. Okay, well, let's try something else, right? So I totally get what you're saying uh, on that. Um, yeah. So talk about price. Yeah. Um, I, I, it's, it's inherently linked to what we just discussed. And I yeah. think something I always encourage agency owners to remember is we're always going to have that conversation of like, why is this so expensive? My cousin, my niece could do it for 50% of this, or the other firm said 30% of this. And I, you know, there is a, um, you might have to send to me over this, but there was an oven mitt I saw in the window somewhere the other day. And it said, it was, you know, someone, it was the oven mitt and on it, it said, you know, bitch, I'm the secret ingredient. And I was like, well, Hey, that's reason number one. I was like, we are the secret sauce and that's what you're paying for. I was like, but the reality is what that, what you need to listen for when you hear that question is, do I have someone who's trying to negotiate? Or do I have someone who's minimizing value? Because that's a really informative moment uh, before you sign a contract with someone and negotiation. We, let's do it. You know, if, if you only have this amount of budget and this is what I'm pitching, like let's have, let's, let's have that um, getting to yes moment and figure out what makes this work for both of us. And maybe there's a way I can't charge what I want, but I can get value in some other way, whether it's an introduction or getting to try something new on the project, who knows, there, there are other ways to generate value that I'm okay reducing the price of my service for at times. But value minimization is something different. And that is to me, when we're, when you're interacting with someone who simply can't believe that you provide value that's resonant with what you're charging. And that's to me, that's the red flag. And that is, I will not continue the conversation. That is, if, then if you would like to go work with that person, please go ahead. But this is, this is our price and we're sticking to it because that person is so shocked. They're not uncomfortable with the price and trying to figure out they are shocked that you would have the audacity to try to charge that when they could get it so cheap somewhere else. You're not going to get the same thing from those people. You want this team of mountaineers to lead you to the top of the mountain? Go with us. You want to stay at a Holiday Inn Express? Great. This is the Ritz Carlton. Like, and this is the price we charge for that service. And it may be the same exact, I know it's not, it may be the same exact bed with the same sheets and linens on it. But this is where you're coming for an experience that you're not going to get at that other place. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Um, John, I have one last question. First of all, I want to thank you. Mm -hmm. I want to point people to nativesgroup.com. Check out more about what you do. And there's, there's some great uh, blog posts and they can check more about your company. Mm -hmm. um, check out more episodes of the podcast. Check out rise25.com. Any other places we should point people online, Jonathan, besides nativesgroup.com? Uh, or is that the best place? Yeah, I would say, well, you know, please connect with me on Twitter. My DMs are always open. John E. Jacobs, J-O-N-E Jacobs. Uh, I also write a bit on Medium, Johnny Jacobs 89. So I'd love to connect with you there. Um, but I'm a social animal. So find me on social media. would love to, if you have any questions on anything I said today or want to continue the conversation, want to debate me, I'm up for it. Let's, let's go. So last question, and I know we only have a minute or so, but what's been sticking out in my mind, there's so many good gems of, from this discussion. I'm going to have to go back and listen. But what sticks out in my mind that we kind of glossed over a little bit is your journey used to be 265 pounds. If anyone's looking at you, you're mm -hmm. a lean, mean fighting machine. Now I'm curious, um, what were the things that you did maybe mindset wise or otherwise to, to make that transformation? Cause really what we're talking about is transformation, whether it's a book wanting to be bestseller mm -hmm. or whatever, it's a transformation. So I'm curious about your personal transformation. Uh, thank you um, for asking about that. Yeah. So, you know, I wait, that was my peak was like the summer before college. I weighed like 260, 265. For me, getting to college made all the difference in the world. Um, to the, what we talked about before of willpower, going to the cafeteria 
or going into the kitchen in the, in, in our dorm, uh, our dorm hall and cooking, like I chose what was on my plate and I ate very bland food for a little while. Like I was very into the idea of food as fuel. Um, and it, in that period in time, that's what I needed. You know, I was basically having a tuna salad for lunch every day and it was, it helped me. It helped me build that routine and that control helped me make sure that I wasn't inflating my my routine with excess calories that was going to push me off. I started exercising more than as well, but I was exercising even before. So it's really a reminder of how important nutrition is. Um, so that, that was kind of that first weight loss period that brought me from like 265 down to 185. And then ever That's since, tremendous. I always, you know, I wow. always go through the band of one eight, between 185 and probably 205. I'm constantly fluctuating in that 20 pound unit. Um, but now it's a different fluctuation. It's muscle that may be causing that as I go back and forth. And then it's, yeah, there are times that I'm bad. I had, I had a, three scoops of ice cream last night. I felt guilty about it because I have a, I, I have a historically poor relationship with food. That's something I'm always working on, but I'm allowed to have that because I chose it. I want it. And I build a routine where I can eat whatever I want. Now I try to be smart about what I do. Um, but I'm also, I think what's helped me in this phase of my life now is I'm very protective of my exercise time. Um, like for me, I, I live on the West Coast. My team is on the East Coast. So I tend to keep East Coast-ish hours. And what's been great is that I work out every day at three o'clock and it makes me stop working, which is super because I would work until you know five or six o'clock, which means I'm working almost 12 hours a day. Because um, you're waking up really early for it to be an exactly. East Coast time. Exactly. So I missed my morning workouts and it's, it's been awesome. We also got a Peloton. So it's an easy way to like sit, you know, if we weren't doing an interview and you and I were just catching up, I frequently take calls on the bike um, just to passively kind of ride and get some movement in, um, but protecting the time. And then I also, for me, and this is something I work on again, because being in a partnership with someone, I know my relationship with food is I can only really have one bad meal a day. And I don't, I know it's uncomfortable for some people to, to hear food judged in that way. But for me, it's, I need to have a healthy meal and I can have a, a less healthy option, which is like, I got to have a salad for one meal a day. And then I can have a burger or a tuna melt or, you know, uh, a big dish of some kind later, but I need to have that balance. If I have both, I just don't feel well. It's not psychologically that I'm upset with myself. It's just my body feels off. So for me, it's building, okay, I know my partner may want to go to dinner tonight. So let me have a healthier option for lunch. So I don't constrict that. Or I know we have, I have a lunch meeting. So, Hey, in advance partner, I'm going to be a little bit more conservative for dinner tomorrow. So those are some of the things I, but for me, it was really just about getting, putting myself in a position where I was in control of what was in front of me. Um, and, and that's, what's really made the difference. Jonathan, thank you. I want to be the first one to thank you. Check out nativesgroup.com and more. Thanks everyone for listening. Thank you. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand.